Today, the year in show business, 1985. Widespread fear puts Hollywood's love scenes in jeopardy. Cosby's secret of success. I am happy knowing that, uh, that she'll be there. And Rocky takes on Rambo. An exclusive interview with Sylvester Stallone. Hello, I'm Peter Tamarkin. Today on The Hollywood Reporter, we're going to take a look back at some of the stories and personalities that made headlines in the show business world in 1985. The biggest story of the year had a great impact not only in Hollywood, but on the rest of the world as well. The ramifications of the event sent shockwaves through the entertainment industry. The date was July 25th, and subsequent descriptions have included words such as hysteria, paranoia, blacklisting, and witch hunt. Our headline story today investigates a situation that may change Hollywood love scenes forever. Mr. Rock Hudson has acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Perhaps no single event has had a greater impact on Hollywood since the Red Scare of the 50s. The disclosure that Rock Hudson was gay and had AIDS sent shockwaves throughout the industry. Immediately, there was a media avalanche on the subject, which helped enlighten an ill-informed public on the dreaded disease. However, the implication that Hudson had the illness while involved in romantic scenes on Dynasty quickly enveloped the community in what People magazine described as hysteria. What I've seen is no different here than it is anywhere else in the country, and that is people being concerned about it, as well they should be. Uh, people are concerned about their own health, their own well-being, their children's well-being, and there's nothing hysterical about that because there is a disease out there that is devastating. <sighs> In television, the greatest impact of the AIDS fear has been among the soap operas, prime time as well as daytime. I think the fear is in both places. Because we know so little about AIDS, and since there are romantic scenes in both primetime and daytime, people are naturally afraid. But because daytime is on every single day, and because they just by, they, they have more love scenes simply because they have more scenes, I think the fear is, is there more. Concern among actors on the highly rated soap, The Young and the Restless, escalated to the point where a doctor was called to the set to allay cast fears. In addition, plot lines were reportedly changed away from explicit romantic scenes so actors would not be forced to engage in intimate contact. For a while, we weren't even, when the, when the whole Rock Hudson thing happened, we, we weren't even allowed to kiss on the lips for a couple of weeks. It has, has had a direct effect uh, on, uh, on the work that we do. And in fact, um, uh, we had a doctor in. Uh, on our show um, several months ago to uh, to talk with people about the facts uh, of the disease and uh, and and hopefully to calm everyone's fears about it. They were particularly concerned about uh, the act of kissing on the set. Now, um, I it's not my usual uh, occupation to be on a set, and I did ask them exactly what went on. Uh, and uh, the answer was, what does it look like? And I said, it looked like really kissing. And it was a deep, uh, intimate uh, form of uh, interaction that was being filmed. And they answered that, indeed, that was the case. And that's why they were concerned. You just told me. Though many within the industry are reluctant to talk about it, it seems The Young and the Restless was not the only daytime drama to be directly affected by the AIDS scare. I've noticed a marked decrease in the degree of romance and certainly I think in the intensity of it. Uh, you know, about, I can go back about two years ago when uh, romantic scenes were quite intense. Now we're, 
We're moving away from it. We have not gotten into it storyline-wise on our show, which surprises me a little bit because I've noticed over the years that very often daytime shows do deal with very controversial issues. And because we can write the script so quickly and get it on the air so fast, uh, we're usually the first to do it when it comes to television. Think money, money, money. <laughs> Actors and actresses working on some of television's more romantic programs now have to deal with what they would do if they're cast into a love scene which requires kissing. It's a very personal decision to make. And if I had any uh, discomfort about working with an actor, I would deal with that myself. I would deal with the actor in a manner that made me comfortable. I hope that it would make him comfortable as well. It's something you really do have to think about, and I think that if you are romantically linked on a series or in a scene with someone who's possibly homosexual, I think it's for me to establish a relationship with them where I feel comfortable enough to say, well, um, is, you know, are we okay about, about doing this? And about them comfortable enough to say, well, I've had a test or I haven't had a test. Or, but I think that people have to be very honest because it is a life-threatening situation. Well... I was hardly daddy's little girl last night, was I? Well, I think some people have a great concern, and I think it's a valid argument, you know, that those people who have to have, to, um, have kissing scenes with people, that if, if they feel that uh, the people that they're going to be kissing might have something which is undesirable, then I think it is a, they have a valid argument. Don't keep me waiting too long. Well, I won't. The controversy over kissing led to a motion by the Screen Actors Guild to require producers to inform cast members in advance if they are to be working in scenes involving open mouth kissing. Such kissing was placed in the hazardous work category, an area usually covering dangerous stunts. I think that if an actor feels threatened by any kind, any hazardous condition, that's, that's actually the wording in our uh, ruling, uh, they have the right not to do it. The producer has the right not to hire that person. Out of all of this, the community hit hardest has been gay actors. Gays claim the paranoia has already led to blacklisting. For this reason, a gay activist and actor who agreed to be interviewed on this program requested anonymity to protect his career. What AIDS is actually doing is giving people a continued license to discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation. That. AIDS allows a person to reinforce their basic homophobia. I hope we don't drive every dear gay person back in the closet for this. That concerns me deeply. I care about you so much, you know that. In 1986, romance on television will likely evolve into a new era as the medical world pursues crucial answers to the question of how AIDS is transmitted. The gay acting community must face still another obstacle, and Hollywood as a whole looks toward a difficult future. If this continues and if you see less um, suggested love scenes, less explicit love scenes, then where are they going to put all their fire? Because it kind of like romance has always been like the bread and butter of soaps. If they kind of have to pull back on that, I wonder if they're going to put more, more of their time and money into action, adventure, and violence, which is kind of sad to me. And I think they might. Younger guys coming up and women are they're really angry. They don't want to stay in the closet. They want to stand up and be counted. And I've had to say, <laughs> from a perspective of an older guy, you can't afford to do it. You will be hurt. I have some very close friends who, who have died or are dying of the disease. And this is, it's personal. This is real people dying, not, not your enemy. You know, real people. If the year in television in 1985 were to be characterized by a single form, it would have to be labeled the rebirth of the sitcom. Pioneering that comedic renaissance was The Cosby Show, TV's top-rated primetime program. How true to life is the love affair that describes the Huxtables? Well, let's meet the woman at the heart of The Cosby Show. probably wouldn't know it from surface appearances, but inside this illusion factory of a television studio, on the streets of Brooklyn, a real life love affair brews daily. I just know that every day I come to work, 
I am happy when I wake up knowing that, uh, that she'll be there. She's not exactly like my mom because we're kind of close in age. Uh, she's, but she's always there. It's sort of like a real mother-daughter relationship, I have because if I have a question, I can ask her. She's another crazy woman. I, it's, it's like we have a whole cast of crazy people, and but, but we have a lot of fun together. Uh, we love each other. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes, uh, Mr. Lucas, this is my wife, Mrs. Huxtable. Well, hello, Mrs. Huxtable. Well, hello, how are you? Fine, thank you. Uh, have you found out what's causing our leak? No, but I'm sure it wasn't your fault. Well, thank you. A major reason The Cosby Show has been the biggest hit of primetime television is the true affection that the cast members feel for each other outside of their roles on the show. And beside Bill Cosby himself, one of the key ingredients in bringing this realistic family to life is Felicia Ayers Allen, who portrays Claire. The Cosby Show has moved the theater-trained actress and mother of a teenage son offstage right into the national spotlight. The success of the show has made everyday life much more meaningful and important to me. It has made um, the time taken to relate to my son and his everyday needs much more important to me because that's what the show is about. It's about everyday life, the importance of everyday life, of taking that time to share yourself and to give your love. You know, Rudy, you could always tell me the truth about anything. It really doesn't matter what it is, because I'll still love you. It takes a lot of energy to be a mother. It takes a lot of energy to be a parent, a real parent, but there was and to really pay attention, to listen to how the basketball game went and what shot got the ooh and the ah, you know, and to wake up cheerful. Let's see. <laughs> The answer to Sunday breakfast? Yes, I bought that. Waffles, Claire. I'm going to make waffles every Sunday morning. <laughs> Until you had to clean it. As the second lead, Felicia has been given a great deal of accolades for the success of the show. But she is very quick to point out who remains the program's focal point. Bill. <laughs> he is the key. I don't know when I've ever met someone from the Western world who had such an in-depth understanding of the human being. I mean, it's phenomenal. When I worked with Bob Culp in, in I Spy, that was one of the important things that Bob said to me, because I knew nothing about working in a series. And Bob said that it truly is, is a marriage. And two people, that they must be happy with each other. The scripts can be bad, you can have a horrible director, the executive producers and the producers can be bad people, but if the two principals or the people who work every day, that you work every day with, if they're good, then you can, you can have a successful feeling with all of the actors. And it's just a pleasure for me to get up and come here and see her face. you end up with a woman like that? <laughs> Just lucky, I guess. You got that right. <laughs> now it's time to take a look at what's happening today on our feature page. Here's Meredith McRae. Meredith? Thank you, Peter. It's been one of the longest-running debates in Hollywood history. Do films and television merely reflect life or influence it? Today on our feature page, we're going to look at some personalities who definitely set trends in 1985. Our first story comes from Miami, where reporter David Kreef profiles a man whose participation in a television series influenced no less than TV style, music, and fashion. He's Philip Michael Thomas of Miami Vice. True to the lyrics of his song, 
Philip Michael Thomas has always had a plan of dedication and determination that has painstakingly progressed him through an acting career that began with films such as Sparkle and Book of Numbers. His perseverance paid off big with the co-starring role on the trend-setting TV series Miami Vice. Don't tell me what I know, all right? Hey man, don't jump in my face because you let your friend play you. You got to be with everybody except the one person you should have got it together with from Jump City. This last year, year and a half has been, whew, I'm in a tremendous leap into something that, you know, most people only dream about. And uh, it's from, uh, from my point of view, it's like not overwhelming, but I, I kind of like get caught up into it. It's like instead of uh, running from it, I run to it. The Miami Vice phenomenon has allowed the multi-talented performer a number of opportunities to express his creativity. In a show like Miami Vice, you have to become a partner. You know, if you stay on a show for any period of time, and when you're a partner, you got to share your wares. And since I do so many things, uh, I am writing an episode uh, for Miami Vice that I think is going to be really uh, a, a smash. Now, we haven't had any women that have been villains on our show. You know, my episode has a, a woman that's a villain. You know, I'm kind of bringing in the things. I don't know, you know, our show is basically a male-oriented show. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten fan letters that say, well, what is this macho stuff, you know? So I'm, I'm going to help the ladies out a little bit. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Philip's popularity stemming from Miami Vice drew the attention of Atlantic Records, who signed him to his own record label, Spaceship Records. For Philip, it was a fulfillment of a lifelong dream. Your first album... Philip Michael Thomas, Living the Book of My Life, just released. How do you feel about it? Oh, ecstatic. It's actually been about 20 years, 21 years, that I wanted to do this. I, I had a, my first opportunity at, at signing a uh, recording contract at 15 and a half, you know, and things changed, it didn't happen. It's like a detour. But here it is, I'm 36, you know, and it's come around. You reflect the passion of a woman. Lightning struck the same place twice. It's incredible. I think it's the first time in the history of the music business where a, an artist uh, who had never re even released a 45 got a label logo deal. It's really exciting. It's, it feels good to, to mind my own business and own my own business. Yeah, it feels great. I got you starry I don't know where it's going to go. You know, uh, I mean, I, I hope I live a long time. Uh, and in that, that life, I hope that wherever I am on the earth, that I will constantly give and give and give and give in some way, shape, or form, because it comes back a thousandfold. No discussion of style in 1985 would be complete without mentioning a phrase that was first popularized on Saturday Night Live. There's almost no place you can go to escape this little saying. It was the subject of a widely seen video and a hit record album. The man behind it all is comedian Billy Crystal. And recently I went to Chicago to ask Billy about that marvelous three-word phrase. If you don't know what I'm talking about, well, you certainly will after this. Darling, I got to tell you something. And I don't say this to everybody. You look marvelous. Absolutely marvelous. Those three words, you look marvelous, have become a household phrase. How often do people come up to you and say those three words to you? Darling, you look marvelous. Well, what the, the master was was 145, which is a lot. Darling, you look marvelous. I kept one of those little umpire things, you know, they, they click off how many balls and try. So it got up to 172. That was uh, in two days in Boston and Philadelphia. You look Marvelous. Are you tired of people saying that? A little bit, but it's um, only because it's been so good to me and it's a freak thing that something that you create hits 
and not just within the industry, but like Monday Night Football, a guy scored a touchdown on the scoreboard that said, you look marvelous. Pete Rose got the hit. It's flash marvelous, marvelous. You look marvelous. You look marvelous. Fernando character, which I love, by the way. Um, Thank you, darling. Tell us the, the story of, of how it actually began. It was on The Tonight Show, right? Without a doubt, the influence was the late Fernando Lamas and seeing him on The Tonight Show. Um, I used to just love to watch him come out and sit and, and, and do what he did, which was just to sit and talk with that macho attitude that he had, which was very appealing and very funny to me. So I started to develop my own character who uh, was a talk show host, and I created this, this Latin lover talk show host from a booth in a restaurant. And uh, so it really developed from there. It's better to look good than to feel good. Get down! But you actually didn't, didn't mean any offense to Fernando Lamas at all. No, the late Fernando Lamas was a very bright, intelligent man. I mean, he never said, you look marvelous the way I do. I mean, I was the essence of what he was doing. We got you where we want you, man. Billy's popularity won him a starring role in an upcoming film with Gregory Hines, titled Running Scared. Observers are predicting that Billy will be the next alumnus of Saturday Night Live to become a major movie star. If that indeed happens, it will be another element of Billy Crystal's show business fantasy come true. Do you have any other fantasies that you'd like to come true? Darling, I don't know if we can get into that. <laughs> uh -huh. Not the dirty one. No, oh. Uh, I pretty much am having them now. As a kid, you know, uh, when I was six years old, seven years old, I was locked in the bathroom making my acceptance speech. You know, I just want to thank everybody in the academy. I'm holding a toothbrush, you know. And uh, I'm just having them. If I thought when I was growing up that I'd be in a major motion picture, hopefully it's a major motion picture, I think it will be, and, and the success that I've had, and to be sitting here doing this show is all part of, like, if you can do what you want in life, how great. You know, if you always dream about, well, I want to be that, and then it happens, ooh, I'm a lucky guy. When I look into your eyes, darling, I see the reflection of me. Look at me dancing around in there. I look marvelous. Absolutely. Marvelous. 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 Still marvelous. 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 Oh, marvelous. <laughs> Absolutely marvelous. Our next story concerns a man who is to comedy what Cindy Lauper is to opera. In fact, he's probably better suited for tales of the unknown than the Hollywood reporter. He's comedian Emo Phillips. And if you think you've seen everything, you've never seen Emo. He's been described as a crazed pterodactyl, a hapless innocent, a school nerd, the Protestant Woody Allen, and a cross between Peter Pan and a plucked chicken. His name is Emo Phillips, and no matter how you characterize him, he definitely has one of the most bizarre and original stand-up acts in comedy today. It's um, nice to be here. I I didn't know what to wear, and uh, my mom came to the rescue. She said, Emo, why don't you wear your grandfather's um, nice dress slacks? <laughs> so uh, I grabbed a shovel. Uh, I love performing live. You know, it takes a live performance to really get all that cigarette smoke into you. And the people are very friendly. I'm often recognized now. Who are you? I walk down the street. I can't do a TV show the next week. People are coming up to me saying, Emo, Emo, you're Emo, aren't you? And I say, yes. And they say, we've been looking for you. Here's a subpoena. Los Angeles is my kind of town. You can get giant pillows at any time of the afternoon. Emo became a comedian nine years ago, and he's now selling out clubs all over the country. He also signed, reportedly, the largest recording deal ever accorded a pure stand-up comedian. 
Epic Records has also produced a video of Emo's exploits. Finally I thought, what's so amusing? So I turned around, and these two guys, for the last half hour or so, had been throwing darts into my head. <laughs> It's a good thing I heard him. With all of his recent success, Hollywood is just starting to discover Emo. But Emo's not so sure he's ready for Hollywood. Hollywood's a weird place. Hollywood people, they can get pretty rude. I'm caught in the rush hour. Traffic, you know, in the intersection. And this guy behind me is honking. Beep, beep, beep. Can't you do something about those stinking fumes? <laughs> I just kept walking. You know, a lot of weirdos in this world. <laughs> but I'm lucky that my parents prepared me correctly, you know? Yeah. Although the other night, as in bed, I heard my parents arguing about me. They're arguing, you know, saying stuff like, oh, I told you he'd live, <laughs> you know? I take each day as it comes. I figure if I can make just one person smile, I've already surpassed network industry standards for a sitcom. Nineteen eighty five was not really a banner year for the film industry. Total receipts were down, in part because fewer films were made. While Back to the Future became the most popular summer release ever, summer ticket sales dropped 10% from the previous year. But it was a good year for moviegoers if you're a teenager, as almost half the moviegoing audience is. A rash of adolescent comedies spread across our nation's movie screens. The studios also tried to get closer to their audience by hiring younger directors. What's it like to be 25 and in charge of a $10 million film? I mean, it is an incredible feeling. It's like somebody saying, I don't know what your greatest dream in the world is, but it's somebody saying, okay, here you go. Some might resent you because you've done this, and they think that, you know, that your dad paid for your film or something, and you're just a kid out there, but I've worked since I was eight years old to do this. I guess what it was like being, it was like being let loose in like, like a little kid let loose in a toy store. I, I think about how it happened often, and I, I, I really can't say. I can't say. There's no logical explanation for any of this. <laughs> Pee-wee's Big Adventure, which marked the starring debut of comedian Pee-wee Herman, was one of the hit comedy films of the year. <laughs> Many critics singled out the film's unusual style, an approach they attributed to Pee-wee's director, 26-year-old Tim Burton, who ironically grew up a few blocks away from the studio where the film was made. Tim landed the job directing Pee-wee after studio executives saw an award-winning short film he made titled Frankenweenie. Everybody's always looking for the new young thing. And I mean, I'm very grateful for that. But I can already see that it's, it's sort of a trap also because it's, there's a constant desire to, to find the new, you know, before I'd even done Pee-wee, I was already hearing about somebody who was the next me. I mean, and that, that's frightening. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm washed up before I've even done my first movie. Better Off Dead was the first feature written and directed by 25-year-old savage Steve Holland, who gambled big to get his chance in Hollywood. I got frustrated. I went three years after college. Nothing was happening. And I invested $20,000 of my own money that took me forever to get. And I made this film and it paid off. I just got my license yesterday. You got your license for when? I can't wait to get mine. It was my, I think the only time I've ever gambled or invested in something. And it worked out. Billy Turner declares war. Blue City, due out early next year, is the first directing job for 25-year-old Michelle Manning, who also used a rather unusual method to get her big break. 
She assisted directors Francis Coppola and John Hughes. You can make millions of movies in film school, but until you know, you know, when it's this big as opposed to this big, and when, you know, just the grand size of everything, I learned a lot about that, and people just knew what I really wanted to do was to direct. But I was, I guess I did go about it a strange way. I wanted to learn first how to really make a feature film. With liberty and justice for all. Good boy. And Alicia Donovan, will you go to the dance with me, please? The Last Chance Dance, an award-winning USC student film, was the traditional method 23-year-old Phil Joano used to break in. It earned him a meeting with Steven Spielberg and a chance to direct an episode of Amazing Stories. He liked the film, which was just a few days after it had screened. I was, it was just like, you know, it was like a friend of mine said, it would be the equivalent to that if you were, if you were a priest, it would be the equivalent to getting, God wants to meet you. You know what I mean? It was like, I mean, that's kind of weird, but... <laughs> Phil found that despite his lack of big-time experience, he was in full control of the episode. Even Spielberg deferred to the newcomer for decision. I got a call from him on a Sunday, and he said, you know, oh, oh, you know, this is Steven. And I was like, Steven? <laughs> you know, and uh, he said, yeah, listen, I've been, I've been thinking about the show, and I, and I'd like, I did, it would be all right if I, you know, read to you, you know, I did some changes, it'd be all right if, if, you know, I read them to you, you know, and, and I, if that's okay. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I mean, he was asking me if it was okay if you read to me his changes. Like, what was that, you know, I was like, what? I, uh, I was so flustered. And before I, you know, could actually respond, he read some things over the phone to me and said, and read, and here's, I'm sitting there thinking, here's Steven Spielberg reading dialogue to me over the phone to me at home, and I was just like, uh, so I was like, it was Twilight Zone time, instead of, you know. Few experiences can ever match the first time a young director steps on the set. I remember thinking I'm going to remember what it's like the first time I say action, you know, the first time I get out there, I want to remember this for the rest of my life. To tell you the truth, um, I was so scared, I have no idea what I was thinking when I first came walking out on the set. I mean, I was, uh, I was so, it was so overwhelming in a sense at first. The first day I was worried that uh, people would be in shock that such a high voice was saying action, you know. Um, and I was worried, oh my God, is my voice going to crack when I say action? My first day on, on the set of Better Off Dead, we had a six o'clock call, and I couldn't sleep. It was like Christmas. I couldn't sleep at all, and we were shooting up in Glendale. And I was driving in my little Jeep. I got there at four in the morning. I was so excited. I couldn't sleep anymore, and I drove up there. And there's like, there's so much that goes into it. It's like an army, you know, and I had like, just drove up, and I kept seeing all these trucks. I was thinking, God, someone's moving into this neighbor, and it was us. Wow! Ah! Although their youth is a factor, the young directors say it hasn't had an impact in their work. Man, that's a real shame when folks be throwing away a perfectly good white boy like that. Savage Steve is currently editing his next film, My uh, Summer Vacation, at a budget to, um, of ten million dollars. It's sometimes a hindrance and sometimes it's very helpful. I and mean, people think it's neat that I got started so young, but to me it's like it's been an eternity. And um, on the other half, it's sort of it's tough because when people review you, they really always mention that. And if they like you, they think it's great, and they'll mention it in a really nice way. If they don't, they'll say, I'm, I have a continuing adolescence. Everybody says, oh, young people know what young people want. I, it depends. I mean, I hope when I'm 45 as opposed to 25 that I'll still be in touch with what kids like, because it'll be what I like. I hope I never grow up. I just want to make a lot of films that are funny and get better, and I'd love it. I'd love to be 50 and have a retrospective of my films that took you know eight weeks for people to see them, all of them. I'd love to make so many, and uh, and hopefully make some that were just great. I try not to sit down and say, you know, I want to I want to be Steven Spielberg or I want to be Francis Coppola or I want to be Martin Scorsese because what I hopefully like to be is is just Phil Juano. You just have to never give up. I mean, that's it's everybody says, oh Michelle, you're so relentless, and I said, well. There's no other way to be. I mean, you have to just keep trying. It's nice when it pays off. Never in the history of the film business has an actor had two successful movie series running at the same time. Now, that's the delightful predicament facing Sylvester Stallone this year with Rambo and Rocky IV. 
How is one of Hollywood's top creative talents dealing with the pressures of being number one at the movie box office? Roy Firestone turns in this exclusive interview with Stallone on the set of his next film, Cobra. I'm just basically a young guy walking around, uh, just a victim of circumstance, just trying to make ends meet here. After three prior knockouts at the box office, Rocky Balboa, America's favorite fighter, has returned to the ring for a fourth bout. Rocky's return was actually something of a surprise to some because the character's creator and alter ego, Sylvester Stallone, had been quoted after Rocky III saying the series was over. Well, Rocky IV, how's it going to be different? I know you're fighting a Russian and you said this will be your last Rocky movie. What will be different about it? Originally, I, I thought the Rocky situation was completed with the trilogy because I had been influenced by the Studs Lonigan trilogy when I was sure. very young. Now, I said, my God, what has happened is Rocky's always dealt with almost neighborhood-type problems, very, very, his own small world. What would happen if this fellow, this southpaw from Philadelphia, is now thrown into the arena of international politics? I must break you. Actually, Rocky IV is the second film this year to thrust a Stallone character into the global political arena. Rambo was one of this year's most popular films. With these two roles, Stallone has managed to vault above cinema and into Americana. With all the characters of Rocky, with Rambo, they all deal with the pride aspect. <laughs> What I try to do is, is I have a lot of questions about life in general. I mean, is life really worth it? What, what makes life more valuable? And, and when you get right down to it, it's, it's man's basic pride. Uh, without a pride, you really don't feel as though you can stand tall and your quality of life is quite diminished. You're in a very lofty position being one of film's top box office attractions. Are you afraid of the trappings of success or the traps of success? That's a good question, yes. I, I, I do become a little unnerved by it because um, it seems my world is, is very, very small. It, it's, I can't really go out and, and walk around and enjoy life the way I used to. I mean, right now it, it's kind of like sometimes a dangerous situation and, and other times it's a superficial and, and, and fake situation where, where I, in other words, I can't believe my film image because if I start to follow that and believe that then I I think I'll really end up with a distorted perspective because I mean it's nice to play a hero but it sure would be more exciting to be a hero mm -hmm. I mean so I can't pretend that I am John Rambo I can only interpret it and basically what I'm trying to do is take the real people in life and the things that they've done and try to make heroic roles out of that and, and not say that yes I am the hero now as Stallone acts in his next film Cobra in which he plays a cop stalking a psycho killer. Compared to the various demands of Rocky IV, it's almost a breather for a man who enjoys a near fanatical zeal for athletics, both on and off screen. What intrigues you more, the art of sport or the sport of art? <laughs> Well, that's a good one. I, I would have to say, when you get right down to it, the uh, art of sport, really, because it's it's such a limited time expanse, you, and you have to jam so much, oh, God, training and emotion and love and defeat and pride, and everything goes into those few few, few years. But art is nice, too, but it's not, it's not quite as uh, painful. On our back page today, a look back at the biggest event of the past week, Christmas. Now, Hollywood usually does everything bigger, better, and more glamorous than anywhere else. This caused America's second favorite game show host, Pat Sajak, <clears throat> host of TV's most popular syndicated program, Wheel of Fortune, to wonder how they do Christmas dinner in the capital of illusion. Here are the delicious results. You know, Hollywood is really a, a magical land, a home of television, and movies, and Joan Collins. 
You know, I was thinking with Christmas just around the corner, what would a traditional Hollywood Christmas dinner be like? Wow, it must, must really be something, I mean, where they can create all these wonderful illusions. I tell you, I get hungry just thinking about it. Imagine a Hollywood Christmas dinner. Mm. Where? Uh, I'm, in, I'm in a restaurant. I, I must work here. Well, look at this food. It's fabulous and beautiful, and it's, it's not frozen. That's the best part. Wow, this is... Where, where am... Oh. Welcome to Trump's, Pat. Well, thank you. Who are you? I'm Michael Roberts. Well, Michael, the food looks wonderful. A Christmas dinner in Hollywood. Wow, I... Some of it I recognize as traditional stuff, but, you know, this is Hollywood. There's some unusual dishes, too. Why don't you describe what you've got here? We have uh, Washington oysters on the half show with green salsa and American caviar. Colorful little devils, aren't Colorful they? Colorful, and it tastes good, too. Yeah. It's not Christmas without oysters. Now, I've always said that. That's, in fact, that's over my mantle. I have that. Uh, oh, yes. We have a baked uh, Florida red snapper with cabbage and bacon. It's oh. sort of done in the style of a suckling pig. Uh, your but fish I... exploded. I don't know how to tell you this. We have a creme brulee tostada for dessert. Now, see, the, the dessert is what now? It's a creme brulee, traditional creme brulee, put into a tostada shell. That sounds very Southern very, California. Very Southern Could California. Could I see the fudge ripple taco? Is that possible? No, this is very nice. I like this. And what, what else? And you these are chocolate truffles. This looks all wonderful. What, uh, what's your favorite dish here? Where, where would you begin I would eating? begin with the oysters. Mm -hmm. But guess what? I'm beginning with the ham. Aha. Uh -huh. Thank you, Michael. This looks... And this is all for me? All for you. Oh, I love fantasies. Let me just put this in here. I'm going to go with the ham. Oh, this looks great. Somebody stole my ham. There's a song title there. This food looks... This is beautiful. There's no ham. Merry but... Christmas, and welcome to Max of Triangle. My name is Joachim Spichel, and I prepared you this contemporary Christmas menu. They're beautiful. Uh, I don't think of them I, as... as traditional Christmas dishes here. I mean, do, do people come in and expect a, a turkey and a goose and a ham? No, not at all. They, they know they get something special. Well, I don't want to rush you, but what are some of the things we have here? Uh, we start off with the art deco of truffles and potatoes. The main course is very traditional for the fall or for the winter time, is a venison game mm. with chilean of celery root and pumpkin. So this is deer this for is Christmas, deer. not reindeer. Not reindeer. All right. I'm and we go... Oh, the desserts. The sweets. The desserts. You forgot Look those. at the desserts. Oh. You have a, a souffle of hazelnuts with cranberry sauce, uh. a mousse of blackcurrant, mm. and the big cakes. It's all so beautiful. I almost hate to eat it, but you notice I don't hate to eat it. I'm going to eat it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And bon appetit. You said it. This is it. Oh, brother. <laughs> This is getting ridiculous, but the food is looking good. Let me guess, someone's going to walk in. I just know it and introduce himself. Good evening, Pat. Merry Christmas to you. Well, thank you we very much. We were expecting you. Well, that makes one wow. of us. Traditional Christmas dinner. <laughs> yes, uh, you are? Chef uh, at and, the bistro. And your name is? George. George, this food looks wonderful. I am so hungry. I just want a Hollywood Christmas dinner. Uh, tell me about this. It looks very traditional. Well, you would start with the uh, appetizer, of course, with Graf Lux. Oh, or yes. Our, salmon. our homemade yeah. salmon, yes. Mm -hmm. And then you could enjoy the pheasants. Oh, yes, look at it. And twins, With too. The twins, yes. yes. Kind, of, kind of sad when you think about it. Now, we've, we've done our openers, and now what are we going to go to? Oh, this is... And this, of course, oh. over there is the goose. George, thanks. Great explanation. I'd like to talk more, but I, I need to eat. I want this Hollywood Christmas dinner. I'm going to start with the goose. It looks great. <laughs> where, where's the, where, where's the table? Where's the food? Why? Why am I having this bad dream? It can't be something I ate. Where? Where? Oh, what a, what a decision to make. All that food looks so good. What am I going to have for a traditional Hollywood Christmas dinner? I guess I'll have to make that decision the way I make all my decisions these days. Come on, goose. Merry Christmas, everyone. Well, that's our look at some of the stories and personalities that made the headlines this year in show business. We certainly hope you enjoyed it. I'm Peter Tamarkin. Have yourself a happy new year, and we'll see you here next year on The Hollywood Reporter. Bye-bye.